Mr. Ajay Piramal, who is one of India's leading industrialists, philanthropists, and the chairman of the Piramal Group. Good morning. It's nice to see so many people on Saturday morning early. I want to begin with a quote of Charles Dickens, which is pretty famous. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the season for light. It was the season for darkness. If you look at what's happened since late 2019 till today, in many ways, you would say that it was the worst of times. At least, I don't know of any risk manager anywhere in the world who had taken into account that the whole world will come to a standstill when COVID-19 struck us. There was a lot of uncertainty, as you know, in the world, in India. And images, particularly in the foreign press, of migrant labor just fleeing cities like Mumbai and all with their luggage, with nothing to eat, and horror stories being heard. Just after we overcome the phase one, next year you had the new variant of COVID and you saw images of bodies floating in the Ganga. So people were worried. We were trying to get over COVID and if it was just a year ago, that the whole Ukraine conflict started. Again, I don't know of any risk manager who had forecasted this. If that was the case, Germany would not have continued to depend so much on Russia for their gas and oil. In between, the Ukraine conflict continues we had the meltdown in a lot of the early startups. Then we've had, I mean, I can keep recounting so many things. We've had the pull out of a lot of FII money coming out of India. We've had the Hindenburg report. Now you have SVB collapse, then you had the Credit Suisse crisis. So crises one after the other have happened. And during all this period, you will find that in spite of the crisis, we in India have actually come out stronger. Which other country in the world could do more than 200 crores of vaccinations indigenously developed in India. And not only vaccinations for the country, but also to give it globally. There is no country which could do the direct benefit transfer that we were giving to the, those below the poverty line. No country has been able to give 80 crore Indians free food supplies for the last 28 months. That's how we overcame COVID. And there was a lot of criticism at that time and from a lot of people both within and outside the country about how the economy was being managed. There were questions that there was so much relief being given to companies and to individuals globally. 
in the Western world especially. And here was India, here was the RBI and the ministry acting really conservative and not releasing funding. But at the end of it, what do we find? We do find that the way we managed COVID has probably been better than any other country in the world. Look at the Ukraine conflict. Again, there were many questions on why was India's stance what it was. But now look at, on one year later, you find that we are in a much better situation as far as the conflict, as far as the consequences of the conflict are concerned than any other country is. In fact, during the height of the conflict, it was, I remember, mid-2022 last year, and in the opening, uh, Aniket spoke about my uh, Indo-UK CEOs forum, where you have CEOs from UK and India meeting, and I remember saying that, that actually by June 22, India's economy had become bigger than that of the UK. Nobody expected that. So to become, in spite of all the challenges, the fifth largest economy. And this has happened only in the last decade. In, in 10 years ago, India was ranked 11th in terms of size of the economy globally. Now it is the fifth largest. If we go by what Morgan Stanley says and what many others are saying, in the next four years, our economy will be the third largest after the US and China and ahead of Germany as well as Japan. So that is in some ways the strength of the Indian economy. When FII's were exiting last year, you all are there, you are the ones who invested in the Indian markets and gave confidence. The collapse of SVB, the collapse, or not collapse, but the crisis of Credit Suisse has not had any impact, I think, on India. Whether it is the Hindenburg report where people said, you know, what's happening to governance, what's happening to the Indian markets, it's not transparent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's still the markets have taken that in their stride and gone ahead. And you know, we always talk a lot about how regulation in India is very lax and how there's crony capitalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But just think of it. $210 billion is the deposits of SVB Bank. And what has the Fed done? They have guaranteed that everybody gets it. So all the errors which have been made by the bank are being subsidized by the Fed. Similarly, in Credit Suisse, overnight, $40 billion has been given by the Swiss authorities. Again, it is somebody else's fault, but the people are bearing the cost. And therefore, very often when we are critical of our country, do recognize that there are others who do this in a much bigger way. So where are we today? And that's what I feel. It was the worst of times in the last few years but as far as our country is concerned, it is now to be the best of times. As the economy goes from being the fifth largest to being the third largest, when we are talking of $10 trillion, what it means is that there is going to be that much more wealth which is available in the country. Last year, 
30% of the population in India was mid-income population. And it took about 20 years for that. It was a middle-income population, which really is the one who invest and who, are, uh, who drive consumption. Estimates say that in the next 20, 25 years, this is going to double. So therefore, there is going to be that much more wealth which will come into the hands of the people. Today, there are so many companies which are not startups, which have started, which can see a growth path and which need, and which, can, which also have the demand, but they need funding. They need both equity as well as debt. And you cannot get debt unless you have equity. In fact, the way I'm seeing it is with all these stresses going on in the system, banks, NBFCs are all becoming much more risk averse. Risk averse means that they would expect more equity capital to go in. These are good companies which have good growth, but still don't have the access to capital. And that is where, and many of these companies cannot even list because they are not large enough to list and the potential for their growth will flower in the next two or three years. I think you're going to hear some examples I'm told today. So this is where I think there is a huge demand that is coming in. And this is where uh, funds like this can come in. Today, if you look at it, private equity funds, almost 90% of them are global funds. And I'm seeing the trend in global funds. More and more want to do only larger deals. For them, even 200 million is the deal, or 300 million, a billion, and so on. Therefore, there are many companies which are caught in the middle and don't have access to funds. And that is where, if, where there is a need, and which, is, which will also power the growth of India. India cannot only grow on la with large businesses. We need mid-sized businesses to grow. We need the SME sector to grow. That's how the country can go ahead. And that is where you need people who can understand this business and invest in them. And therefore, I believe that there's a huge opportunity for funds, funds, and to me, what is the characteristic of a successful fund? One is the ability to understand the ecosystem of smaller companies, which is what global funds cannot do. That's only where Indian funds can do. Understand the ecosystem of smaller companies where data is not available as much as in larger companies. There are no analyst reports. There are no, not enough of rating and track record. So those, those investors who can identify First of all, such companies who've demonstrated a track record of successful investing over a period of time, who've got skin in the game, who've putting their own capital at risk along with the investor's capital, and who have got high governance and a high quality of people. I think there is going to be a huge need for this, and there's going to be a huge opportunity for people, both investors, to, uh, crea uh, to create wealth in it. Because again, in an economy, when wealth increases with an individual, you first start investing in fixed deposits. But that, after that, the next stage is you go a little more risk and go into mutual funds, say. And, and debt funds. 
And finally, you go into equity. I think that with the growth that's happening of wealth in this country, as I said, I see this transition already taking place as more and more people who had never invested into equity would now start investing. And that is where, if there are reliable, credible funds, there's a huge opportunity. We also need to recognize that because these companies are not listed, somebody who has a good team of people and a good understanding of the environment can get much more data than what you could get in a public company because there is no SEBI regulation of insider trading or UPSI and et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, in my view, this is a good opportunity for people. The time has come. In your beginning, you said it's an inflection point. I really do believe that's an inflection point for funds like this. And I'm very happy that the Dharamsi family which has four decades of experience in investing, which has, over a period of time, had a very good track record beating the Sensex in most, almost every uh, cut you take of investing, they've done it. They are putting in a fair, a lot of money, their own money, and a good team, I think, this is a time for them, it's a time for India, and I wish them all the success, and I wish all the investors happy investing. Thank you.